This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at reactroundup.com slash kendo UI. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week, we're talking to Brady, is it Gaster? Gaster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I couldn't see his badge, and I wasn't sure. And uh, we're going to be talking about Signal R, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is, uh, I guess, an offering by Microsoft. Well, it's uh, it started in, I think, like in 2011. Uh-huh. Uh, that's about the time that I got involved with it. I um, actually wasn't at Microsoft yet. Okay. I discovered the technology. It was something that uh, two guys on at the time, the ASP.NET team, mm-hmm. now the .NET team. Right. Damien Edwards, who was a PM, and uh, who now owns pretty much everything in .NET. And David Fowler, who was uh, one of the best devs I've ever met. The guy's out of control. But uh, they kind of had a, a mutual idea about doing something with real time and mm-hmm. HTTP because those two concepts go together so well. And they kind of started working on it as a pet project. And I'm in the process of doing it, they made a NuGet package out of it, made a pretty legitimate library out of it. And folks like me and some guys back east, Kevin Griffin and some other folks, got really hooked on it. And we started coming up with all kinds of creative ways for it. Uh, just so everybody knows, the way I met this gentleman was I was jumping up and down in the podcast booth because mm-hmm. I'd just gotten the demo working for tomorrow. And I uh, was pretty excited about it. But um Effectively, what it is is a way that uh, you can do real-time HTTP, and obviously WebSockets comes to mind. Right. But what they did, which was fantastic, is Damien and David kind of had this mentality. They were like, WebSockets are kind of the hot, buttery love right now in real-time mm-hmm. HTTP, but it's not going to be the last thing that comes out. Right. So if we just tell everybody to write to WebSockets, whenever something comes out that's better than that, mm-hmm. like they got to change. Right. So they said, let's create a series of abstractions, both in JavaScript and .NET. Mm-hmm. And now we have them for Java. And I believe there's one for uh, Node.js. I'm not sure. I can't remember all the details. But uh, they basically came up with this idea. Let's try WebSockets first. Right. If WebSockets won't work, we'll fall off and try service and events or mm-hmm. long polling. And eventually go all the way back down to just long polling. Make a long request or just pull, right. pull, pull. So it's an d- intelligent way of figuring out what the server and the client can support. They basically mm-hmm. iterate through a series of handshakes. When the handshakes fail, they say, well, I can't do that. And so then they go to the next one and the next one until you get down to what you and I probably had to do when the PMs told us to make it look like it was real time. Just have something <laughs> refreshing in the background. All the yeah, time. Yep. So, <laughs> yep. So when SignalR kind of came out, it was, uh, you know, everybody kind of jumped on it. It was like kind of an exciting thing. There were some, some similar technologies at the time. I think it was uh, Socket.io in the mm-hmm. Node community. And then Pusher. Um, right. came around and Pusher was kind of a productized version of it. At the time, since Signal, the core component of SignalR is this thing called a hub, uh-huh. and the hub lives on the server. And when right. I say the server, I mean the one server. So if you have a concept of a web farm, you mm-hmm. kind of run into a snafu where if you connect to server A and then I connect to server B and I send a message, you won't get it because right. it's only going to hit that hub. So if I had a whiteboard, it'd be easier. At the no, because what you're talking about then is how do I coordinate between all of the different nodes? Exactly. So there was a couple different implementations of what they called a backplane. Mm-hmm. And the idea was they would put the backplane behind the servers. Right. And that would either be, I think we had three at the time, Redis for folks that were in cloud mm-hmm. and whatnot, uh, Service Bus for folks that were in Azure. Uh, right. Clemens Vaster is the guy that you know, helped build Service Fabric. Um, he, not Service Fabric, Service Bus. He actually helped out with that backplane. And then they added a, uh, a, a SQL one for folks that were on-prem. So they ended up having three. And they're really hard to implement. Like if, if you mm-hmm. wanted to implement one on top of Oracle or something else, it was right. just very difficult. I tried to implement one on top of storage. Talked to Damien and David about it. And they uh-huh. were just like, you know, we really appreciate you trying this. Just stop. <laughs> so it's not going to be a good day. So eventually, some of our peers in uh, the Shanghai uh, Dev Office mm-hmm. uh, came up with the idea of building out what's what you now know as this week of the GA to uh, Azure Signal or Service. And what the Azure Signal or Service does is effectively sit in Azure. Um, right. It does all the authentication and handles everything, and it's kind of a layer in front of your application server. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily as backplane as the backplanes used to be. It's a right. far more robust situation. And what's nice is they GA'd this week. 
And then there's a lot of stuff that's actually happened in the serverless of stuff mm-hmm. and functions. One of our CDAs, a gentleman named Anthony Chu, wrote a series of uh, bindings that you can effectively put into an Azure function. So that if the Azure function runs and you want to notify your web app that may be called the Azure function mm-hmm. in asynchronous capacity, like once the function runs, it can actually call out to a signal our hub using that service right. and it round robins and goes out to all the servers. So, um, and the nice thing about that is it's not just for .NET. It's for mm-hmm. .NET, JavaScript, Java. We have clients right. for all of them. So signalers have really come a long way. Um, but there's still definitely some improvements we could continue to make. I saw some benchmarks. There was currently a... I think, I think it was something around just over a million, I think it was a connect, not a million connections, I think a million messages. Mm-hmm. That's how much it could handle. There were a couple of small improvements that were made, a couple of little bugs that we fixed, and that's gone over like two, two, 2.3 million. Oh, wow. And like the latest stuff. So mm-hmm. the numbers are pretty incredible. 2.3 um, million in how long? I think it was a second or an hour. I can't remember what it was. I have to pull up the slide here. And I'll, I'll make sure <laughs> I get my numbers right for you. Because I've actually got a slide from one of our devs, uh, and I can take a peek at that and make sure I'm quoting the numbers right and show you what that looks like. But, you know, from a JavaScript perspective, it's great because you've got all of the JavaScript clients. So you mm-hmm. could actually, like, dial that in on a public website, you know, right. if you want to. And then it supports all the authorization and authentication stuff that's built right in ASP.net. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to do anything special. Right. You know? So that's kind of a good thing. I'm actually finding those numbers right now. I've got a dev deck here, so half of it I'm not going to know how to how to parse it down for you, but I can definitely show you these numbers here. While I'm finding this, you got any other questions? Well, yeah. So essentially what we're talking about is, yeah, just some real-time coordination between apps. WebSockets messages per, per second, second. One, yeah. 1 million, and then after, mm-hmm. uh, 2.6 million. So wow. that's 2.6 million messages a second. Uh-huh. Wow. And I can just hook that up the way that I handle WebSockets normally? or That's the good part. You wouldn't really even have to worry about the WebSocket part. That's the okay. nice thing about the SignalR clients. So there's a client there's library. A client. Mm-hmm. There's a few different client libraries. There's a client library for .NET, mm-hmm. uh, one for Java, and then one for JavaScript. Right. Uh, effectively, you, you have a concept called a connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, you build the connection by passing in the URL, and then the API literally gets connection.on, uh-huh. and you give it the name of the method, and then you put your callback in there. So okay. it was very similar to like promise-based development for JavaScript folks. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the things that we've seen is that a lot of devs uh, in the beginning at SignalR, they would use SignalR for, for sending and receiving. Right. If you think about, if you really start to think about it, there's nothing wrong with REST. Mm-hmm. And there, there isn't a client uh, for every language and every platform for SignalR. Right. There is a client in every single language, every platform for HTTP. Right. So if you want to send a message to the to the server, mm-hmm. it's usually okay for you to do something with you know just a web API or you know some sort of you know restful right. restful approach. But then on the server, something happens, and that's when you use SignalR to push back out. So if you think about SignalR as a push type mm-hmm. technology, I think that kind of diminishes it a little bit. But the client APIs are deceptively simple. Right. Um, you literally just say connection dot on. In the original SignalR, we had automatic reconnects set up so that if for whatever reason the closed your lid, open your lid up later, right. it would automatically reconnect. The problem with that was we would also try to replay all the messages that had been queued up. And that led to all <laughs> kinds yeah, of bet. problems. So over the past probably two, three years, the devs have really worked hard to kind of kind of back some of those decisions off. Mm-hmm. And one of the things was we turned off automatic reconnects. Right. But the reconnect logic is as simple as, you know, you just have a loop in your code mm-hmm. that says, you know, if my connection breaks, just start it up again. Right. And usually what most people do is they'll do a pause on that for five, six seconds so that if it, if it dies, you just start making a pound again. And what's nice is for folks that are in Azure app service, as an example, um, I can actually push code up to an Azure app service and have WebSockets turned off. Uh-huh. And when I make the request, if I was looking in the debugger, you can actually see in the debugger that it tries to make that WebSocket request and has, a, has an error. It can't find right. the endpoint because WebSocket's not turned on. Then I go into the Azure portal and just hit the on button, turn WebSockets up, refresh the page. Now it's doing WebSockets. So right. A is going to be service and events, I believe, and B would be WebSockets. So, right. um, but the nice thing is the way I think about SignalR is WebSockets is not going to be the, the last thing. Uh-huh. It's the WebSocket APIs change. They're going to change the WebSocket APIs inside of SignalR. If something comes out next year that's better than WebSockets, as you're writing the signal R, we just add that to signal R. Now all of your abstractions are going to continue to fly. Right. So that makes sense. Yep. I'm a little curious then, how do you handle authentication, especially on like a front end 
web application? It's pretty much bare token based. In the ASP.NET world, I'll speak to that because that's kind of where I come from. We have server side things uh, where we can we mm-hmm. can uh, authorize attributes and that kind of thing we can right. put on our controllers. You can put those yeah, same. So server side is yes a, a lot more straightforward. Right? A lot more straightforward. Yeah, but what's nice is is if you if you authenticate to an ASP.NET website. Uh-huh. Or you authenticate to, but well, that's the nice thing about the service too. You would authenticate to the site, uh-huh. then the the site passes the token to the service, okay. and then you know back and forth. So you're still authenticating the proper oh, I got way. You. So yeah. it basically just sits on top of the, the from the server side. It sits on top of the same plumbing as you know the ASP.NET uh, authorization authentication right. stuff works. Right. So, so on my server side, I would essentially say you're good. I would authenticate for you, and then it just yep. talks directly to Signal Water. Exactly. Exactly. I think. I haven't like sniffed the packets or looked at it in a while, but I think effectively what happens is you do the authentication with an OAuth and OID, you mm-hmm. get your bear token, and, and then, then all you, those bear tokens get tacked on top. Yeah, you just pass it up in a cookie or yep. something. Cookie based, yeah, it's exactly right. So yeah, but yeah, it's a pretty good way of doing things. We actually uh, we just recently had the .NET Conf a conference up in mm-hmm. Redmond on Channel Nine, and we had all night. Uh, it was a twenty four hour thing. We had people on uh, the Visual Studio Twitch channel. Mm-hmm. But we also had a couple of mixer shows, and then we had the Channel 9 feed. Right. So we started thinking, well, people aren't going to want to refresh the page mm-hmm. unless you signal are. So we put signal are in there, and then we thought, oh, crap, what if somebody hacks it and they mm-hmm. send in you know, some YouTube video we don't want people to be showing on the dot. Oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> so then we had to add security, and, and people were like, well, how's the signal R stuff going to work? I'm like, done. You know what I mean? It's, it, yeah. just, it just works. You know? right. So that's pretty fantastic. And then we started wondering what's going to happen when we put the service in. Do we have to mm-hmm. authenticate to the service? And that's when we learned those tokens just fly up. So yeah. it's really your app doing the authing. Right. That thing just routes the messages. Which is basically how we want it to work anyway, right? Exactly. I you know who you doing. are. Exactly. Here you go. You don't want the service to have to know too. No. So, exactly. Right, exactly. So it's been cool. But again, so, the APIs are pretty simple. Mm-hmm. So. Right. So you hook it all up. And I'm assuming you just, yeah, you put the client JavaScript you know, into your bundle. I mean, yeah, exactly. The workflow is npm install, mm-hmm. ASP.NET SignalR, and then you basically copy, if you want the min file, you would copy SignalR.js and or SignalR min.js into your, right. into your JavaScript folder. I'll put them in your client and then write your own code to, you know, manage your, manage your connections. And what, right. what people need to do is they really need to initialize that connection Mm-hmm. And then they wire up all their event handlers. So, you know, on chat message arrived, on kickout message arrived, whatever. Okay. You know, you wire up all those handlers. So, so you determine what kinds of events go through. Exactly. Um, and what's really cool is, like, if you think about that hub is, you know, the, the, the center of the world, mm-hmm. you could effectively have public class hub inherits from hub mm-hmm. and then nothing else. Right. And you could have JavaScript on that side and JavaScript on that side. And literally, you're saying, just send it over. Mm-hmm. The other side knows what to do with it. Right. But there could be no code in that hub. So, you know, I've got a, one of my demos I'm doing tomorrow. There's absolutely no code in the hub. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything I'm doing is I'm just doing in JavaScript. And right. it's nice because it just says, hey, he told you to do this, and here's your payload to do right. it with. And then your code just does what it needs to do. That, pretty, that's, pretty dynamic. That, that's interesting. So, essentially, I could come up with my own schema for passing data. Exactly. And I you can get that obfuscate it. Absolutely. Or encrypt it or whatever. Yeah. And it, the other side goes, exactly. oh. It looks like gibberish, but I know how to decrypt uh, this. So. Exactly. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. So, you know, like the traditional example, even though I refuse to ever do them, is uh, I, I will not do a chat example. I'm um, sorry, Anthony, if you're listening. But uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, everybody does it. It's like yeah. a canonical example. But um, if I send you a message, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I could say send a message um, and, you know, handle the receive message event. Right. And I'm going to pass you, you know, a string. Uh, well, mm-hmm. tomorrow I want to pass you a string and an emoticon and the name of the user. I just changed the code. You know, you have right. to change the code on either end anyway. So, yeah. but it's great because it's just like you throw up a ping mm-hmm. and everybody knows how to handle that ping. You know? Yeah. It's kind of cool. You could literally have a JavaScript app on one side and a JavaScript app on the other side and use the, the hub builder syntax, mm-hmm. uh, the JavaScript API. Both would have the same hub URL and each side is just sending messages back. Right. Back. It's really just a proxy. I don't know if it's a proxy, but it's a hub. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I'm wondering about, I'm trying to envision what kinds of apps you would use this for. I mean, the yeah. chat apps, kind right. of the quintessential one. Exactly. But I mean, most of the data-driven apps that I'm using, it's not that far beyond the realm of things to think, you know what? If you're worried about the data being stale, refresh, right? Right. right. But other things, you know, you see things like Google Docs and things like that, right. where you want the collaborative stuff going yep. on to where you, you need that sort of mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. going on. So I, I guess... 
at what point do you start looking at this and going, okay, maybe I do need something like SignalR? It's a great question. I actually love that question. One thing I would say about SignalR, and I, I hate to diminish it because I think that we have a, a lot of opportunities for making SignalR reliable, robust, no mm -hmm. more me dropped messages and that kind of thing. But when I do my presentations on SignalR, one of the things that I tell people is just being completely transparent. Now, I don't know what the exact number is. I don't know what our failure rate is. Right. But let's say I'm going to send you a 1,000 messages with SignalR. Mm -hmm. So legitimate probability, one or two of those messages is going to be dropped. Okay. So you wouldn't want to use SignalR to transmit your credit card data because, or to transmit your order data. Right. Because that one order that you get for 100,000 units of something mm -hmm. might be that one message that you get dropped. Right. Now, that said, you can build that durability around SignalR, but I kind of caution folks, once you mm -hmm. start doing that, kind of start thinking, like, are you, do you have a hammer and you're trying to do a screw? You know right. what I mean? Like, it could just be weird. UI sugar is always a good thing. Right. You know, if you need to know stock tickers, that's always mm -hmm. a really fantastic example. Another example that I've done quite a bit is if I want to see live telemetry coming from the server, okay. I'll basically have a SignalR hub that's watching some sort of a diagnostic right. thing and spewing it to the client. Mm -hmm. Another one that we did recently was kind of fun. In the Kubernetes community, there's a book uh, that they wrote to kind of explain Kubernetes called A, Child's Gu a Children's Guide to How mm -hmm. Kubernetes Works, effectively. Okay. And there's a character in it named Fippy. Mm -hmm. And we, Fippy's the PHP character. So we thought, well, let's build a, uh, let's kind of build an app that shows Fippy and Azure Brady. Um, no relationship whatsoever, I promise. Um, and then like other characters in the community, you know uh -huh. what I mean? With different languages, the Go, Go for, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we literally had a, a page and there's a, there's a Go service running in the background and it watches. And whenever pods pop up, it mm -hmm. throws a REST API. It, it makes a RESTful call to an ASP.NET app that then turns around and pops a signal our message up to the uh -huh. client. And it says, oh, the Fippy app just came online and it puts her on screen. And then when the next app comes online, it puts that on screen. So for things mm -hmm. like that, it's really helpful. Um, I would say that it's kind of like a poor man's pub sub, mm -hmm. but it's not a enterprise pub sub system. Right. Yet, you know, I'd love to make it that one day, but it's not what it is today. But uh, I would definitely use SignalR for things like uh, one thing that we've seen it used for in a couple of different contexts is like uh, driver dispatch. Like if people want to know where somebody is. Right. You got GPS popping a message up. Mm -hmm. You know, you can just plot things on a map. I've seen that. I just mentioned the .NET mm -hmm. comp thing. We basically had a secure back end. Uh, where we could say, show this feed, show this feed, show this mm -hmm. feed. And the moment they hit the client, people saw a new video. Right. So it was great for that. Um, and that's kind of one of those things where if, if you're watching it and you hit the button, for whatever reason that message fails, you can just send it again. Right. You know, but I would definitely say that you know, mission critical stuff, I would be careful. Um, if you start trying to build around a lot of durability to it, start thinking about why you're using SignalR. It right. might not be the thing. But for keeping your UI fresh, uh, mm -hmm. that's great. One thing people have suggested before is in the Entity Framework ORM mm -hmm. that we have, we can actually monitor the SQL statements that are going back and forth and see mm -hmm. how things are happening. I've thought it's, it's like kind of a weird place to put, it, to put a signal our client there so that as the database records are happening, it's sending messages up to the client to see right. what's going on. It's kind of a novel way to do things. Mm -hmm. But what if you see a SQL statement coming and it's half... You might think, oh, there's a bug. It might just be the signal our message dropped some of it. Right. So, and then we also have a new feature. Still haven't wrapped my head around quite how it works yet, but then the later pieces of signal that we've built out, there's actually a new streaming capability. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, and at one point, uh, you know, in the early days, signal did not support binary transfer. Now uh -huh. it does. Uh, now, when I say streaming, I don't necessarily be talking about, like, video or audio streaming. Right. I mean, I don't know if we're there yet. I haven't really dug into that part. That's, like two weeks ago that mm -hmm. I just saw it for the first time. Uh, but if you want to send a whole bunch of numbers, if you want to send, you know, fast changing stock data, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, streaming is great for that because you just turn it on and it's just start sending it. Right. And what's really nice about the streaming implementation is you can actually set up effectively cushions. You can say, I don't want you to send more than a thousand messages at a time. I don't want to receive more than this. And you can actually right. control how that flow works. And that's mm -hmm. pretty powerful. In fact, you can actually, you know, make, if you know you're getting big messages, you might want to throttle them from coming in. So and do you do that thing. at the hub? Yeah, the, mm -hmm. that's pretty low level. So you can do that at the connection of the hub level. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, you mentioned that uh, you could just set up the hub and it just passes everything back and forth. Right. So, so what can you do with the hub? What, what capabilities are there as far as maybe filtering or certain types of events? Or oh, that's great. How, how do you handle all that stuff? That's a great question. I'll actually uh, pull up a slide to kind of walk through it. I know you can't see the slide on the, on the podcast, but it just kind of helps me to walk through it in my mind. One of the things that you can, one of the ways that's cool 
things that's cool about Signal R is that you could say, uh, like when we were talking about the API earlier, mm -hmm. the API is de like deceptively simple on purpose. Uh, what we have is a situation where if you want to call out to clients, you literally say, you know, the hub has a property called clients, mm -hmm. uh, and clients has a property called all. And if you want to, be, and in this case, we're using the, the dynamic hub approach, I would say clients.all.do work. Right. And what that's going to do is every single connected client, no matter who it is, is going to automatically get, get you know, all those messages. Right. But at the same time, we have things hanging off of clients like Caller. In uh -huh. Caller's case, the only person that's going to get the message is going to be the person that issued the message. Right. So, like, I'm going to send you a message, uh -huh. and it's going to come right back to me. Like, maybe that's a read receipt. Right. I send you something, and it tells me you've got it. Right. Um, going on along, you've got others. So mm -hmm. if I send you something, I don't want to get it. Because I just sent it to you. There's no reason right. to waste that network on me. So yeah, I send it to I you and know. it goes out. Right. <laughs> so I already know. I already know what I told you. And then this one's cool. Uh, Clients.group. And you pass in the name of the group. Or oh, groups. gotcha. And you can pass in multiple groups. So in this case, we've got... Uh, you know, client, uh, you know, Damien and Glenn are two PMs on the team. Right. Uh, you know, Andrew's a dev on the team. If the PMs wanted to say something to the devs, they would just reach out and they would use that group. And then obviously we also have user. So right. I can actually target an individual user. And then we've got things like, you know, groups accept, others accept, you know, mm -hmm. you can start to filter all kinds right. of things. So you can really control things here. Can, can you set up your own? I don't know. We do have a new, I know that one of the things that was recently implemented in SignalR is kind of a spec. Uh -huh. So if you want to augment the API, so yes, you could do that. Um, you know, like everybody who has right. green hair, you know, mm -hmm. clients dot green hair people, something like that. <laughs> well, or if your clients can belong to more than one group, I guess you could just manage it that way, right? right. Yeah, yeah. Well, in that case, if you would say, I mean, I think you can actually say clients dot groups, and uh -huh. you can pass multiple groups as right. well. So admins, contributors, not right. readers, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, but if you have people that belong to multiple groups as well, right? So they're a dev and a PM or something like that. Then mm -hmm. You might want to send it to the dev and not the PM or vice versa. Right. The devs and the PM too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's kind of the, the way that the API looks. I don't have any other API things on, on this slide, but I just wanted to pull that up to make sure I, co I covered all the clients areas. The other thing that you can do with the hub, which is nice, is the hub classes. The hub is an abstract class. Uh, and at one point we had, when SignalR was you know, born, this concept of clients dot subset of clients mm -hmm. dot, and then you would look at the IntelliSense and it would say dynamic method. So that was when we were doing dynamics in C Sharp. It was actually right. the first time I used dynamics. It was kind of a dirty word in the .NET community. <laughs> Until I started using SignalR, I didn't really understand why. And it was still, dynamics give a lot of .NET folks heartburn still. So there are some folks who are resistant. Uh, so what do you mean by dynamic? In C Sharp, you have this concept of, like, you might have an object that's a, that's a dynamic object, which means I'm going to, like, I know I can call, like, the hub is a great example of it. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you, I know how to handle the following three events, right. and you're going to call these three methods. The right. only people who care that they're there are us. Right. You know what I mean? And, and that, that gets weird, especially if you want to do type specificity. Like, I always want to hit dot and know what the method looks like. That drives people crazy. So uh -huh. it's really more of a friendliness kind of concept. Right. So now there are even multiple types of hubs. The default hub, actually, you could say uh, send async. And you tell mm -hmm. it the name of the method, and then you pass it a payload. Right. But then when you get, if you were to inherit from hub, that's what you get. If you inherit from dynamic hub, that's when you get the dynamics back. And then we even have one that's kind of interesting that's a generic, that's mm -hmm. a hub of T. Right. And in that case, you get that strong typing. I could say, I know that you're going to hand me back this interface. And I can see the interface, and I can work to it. Right. Um, so that's definitely evolved. That's a huge introduction to the way the hubs work. And then the other thing that every hub knows is when somebody connects and when somebody disconnects. So you can right. actually handle that logic on the server side as well. So, you know, when I connect to something, I can then issue a command back to that connection. I can say, I know you're connected now. Mm -hmm. If you want to do work, you can do some work. And the synth example that you saw me working on when we logged in, it's exactly what happens. I have to make that connection happen before I can send messages to the synthesizer. Right. So I need to make that connection, make sure that I don't get a failure back, and then I start doing the rest of the MIDI work. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how that all dials in. Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, 
FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. It sounds really, really interesting. So how do people get started with this? They just sign up for Azure and it's just one of the options in there? Oh, no, you don't need Azure for SignalR. If you want to get started with SignalR, you can go to docsms.com, docs.microsoft.com or docs.com. If you go to the .NET area, like on the homepage of docs.microsoft.com, there is, you've got all the different categories and all the different products. And for now, the SignalR stuff is definitely it's a component of the .NET team. So if you were to go to .NET here and then you could literally look around for web and I have to find it. But what's nice is we have this .NET Core API reference. I could actually go into this API reference and do a search for signal R. Mm-hmm. And this is actually going to come back with, oh, I'm not going to find it. I have to look around. .NET Standard 2.0? Uh, it might not. I have to find it later. Um, I've actually got in one of my decks, I've got a link. We have a doc page that has literally for the JavaScript folks, I'll give you this link for the show notes. Uh, we actually have a JavaScript reference page that you can go to and learn all about the different things that you can do in the JavaScript client. So I could actually go, see here we've got the ASP.NET mm-hmm. SignalR package. Yep. If I go into that guy, this is literally everything that you can do in that JavaScript client. We've got detailed information on all of it. All most of these reference docs are generated. So we actually generate from directly from the code. So if you go there, you can learn all about it. And as soon as you install the client package, you're good to go? Pretty much. I mean, you, you don't right have there. to go set up a hub or anything somewhere or anything like that? You would have to have a hub. I think you have to have a hub on the server side. So you could literally put a hub up on the server. That would be a .NET thing now, I think. Um, I don't think we have a non-.NET hub server side thing yet. Um, I don't know if that's coming. I just not on the engineering team, so I don't know the answer to that. But if you also go to signalr.net, you can actually learn about it on there as well. Um, we have some of the information uh, out there and you can definitely look and see how everything works. The GitHub for SignalR is github.com signalr signalr. And we have all the documentation you would need on getting started. If you wanted to do this in the .NET world, obviously you would use NuGet. Mm-hmm. You would just install the SignalR package. If you want to do things on JavaScript, that's when you would use NPM. So you would just do NPM install, ASP.NET SignalR, and you get everything. But uh, effectively, the, the, the workflow is, uh, you know, create your hub, uh, run your hub, and then your JavaScript code just reaches out and makes calls back and forth to that hub. You can have a chat app working in less than 30, 40 lines of code. So oh, wow. it's really, really easy. And then the docs have tons of documentation on it as well and a lot of different sample apps. Here we go. Introduction to SignalR. So we have an entire SignalR area in the, in the docs.msconf area. If you want, I could email you some of these links. Make sure you get them on the show. Yeah, notes. yeah, that would be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, so you don't have to know .NET. You don't you have keep, to know .NET. Yeah, you keep mentioning .NET, and yeah. I just want to make sure that people understand. Hey, look, you know. Yeah, you don't have to know .NET. I mean, it was created by the by the .NET team. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and this is this is something that has actually come up. My I've mentioned him a few times, Anthony Chu. We we've had a couple of conversations. We want SignalR to spread to other communities. Right. So I do think it behooves us at some point to have to have something where we we, we don't need to have that hub on the back end. Mm-hmm. I think that you could actually wire up the SignalR service in Azure and send messages to that. Um, but uh-huh. I think you still need a hub to use as to use that as your backplane. Right. So that is a. At this point, that is a, I don't want to say a limitation because I'm a dot .NET guy, but that is a requirement, I think, on the server side. I can get more information and we can update the notes later on if that yep. happens to be the case. But I do believe you have to have a SignalR hub. Yeah, but it makes sense. And yeah. I mean, on any coordination layer, yeah. you're going to need something, you know, on your right. back end. Right. So. But you and I could do JavaScript all the way. Yeah. We could literally have a dot .NET application that has one class in it starts up and is just a hub and you and I just send messages back and forth to it. And as long yep. as you and I are emailing and communicating, mm-hmm. I'm going to call the method too. Yeah. You need to know how to handle it. So, yep. and like I said, the syntax is your typical event driven syntax. It's just, you know, connection on. And then, you know, I'm, I'm looking for some code to show it to you. It's like connection on handle it. Like here's, that's too much. I want to show you that one, but we yeah, definitely yeah, but, made more investments. So, yeah. Yeah, but but in in JavaScript, in Node, in the browser, I mean, we're we're pretty comfortable with event driven. Yeah. So yeah, and it's very promise based. Yeah. The, the the new JavaScript client is all promise based, so you would yeah. have no problem there. Actually, did something the other night. I have it done. I used talking earlier about the REST API plus SignalR combination. Mm-hmm. 
I used the fetch API. I never used that before mm-hmm. in JavaScript. That was pretty cool. It's nicer to use that than have to pull something like jQuery. No offense to jQuery. <laughs> Love it. But to get all those, to do it with all, yeah. without all the libraries, it's just great. Yeah, we, we keep moving forward. And yeah, you also have pretty convenient ways with most of the front-end frameworks to manage your exactly. HTTP calls. and. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's going to look different depending on what people are using. But yeah, you know, you mm-hmm. pull that together. You're using Vue or React or Angular or something, and it, mm-hmm. they have their HTTP library, and you just... Party on it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and that was an early thing that I, I was actually looking through some of the old... In prep for the show today, I was reading through some of the old bugs from 2011, 2013, and beyond. Uh, and one of the issues that repeatedly came up was, like, I love SignalR, I respect jQuery, I'm using Angular, or I'm mm-hmm. using Vue, or whatever. Like, I don't want to have to pull in jQuery just to use SignalR. Right. You don't have to anymore. Right. So SignalR is all native JavaScript at this point. So you don't have to use any libraries. So um, That's a happy thing. It's a happy thing. I remember there was a community member in, uh, I think, in India, who uh, I reached out to him at one point because he'd written a blog post, and I had one of these sessions, and I wanted to show SignalR with Angular, mm-hmm. and he showed me how to do this funky dance where Angular and J- jQuery work together, and I was like, oh, I just geez. feel really dirty <laughs> right now. This is not cool, man. But, you know, I was looking through some of the issues last night, and the day they announced that jQuery was no longer a requirement, people were people were excited. Again, nothing against yeah. jQuery. jQuery saved all of our readers on too many occasions oh, to no throw kidding. it under the bus. But at the end of the day, some people just don't want to pull that down. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and they want to use different frameworks and whatnot. I mean, I think during the show, we've had three or four JavaScript frameworks get released. You know what I mean? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> They've come out so fast. Yeah. So. New framework.js, yeah. Exactly. Somebody mentioned one of me the other day. Uh, I had not even heard about it before, but it, Jeff Fritz, the, the big uh, Twitch guy, um, uh-huh. we were chatting about some JavaScript framework, and he had suggested that I try something. Something instead of Webpack. It was an Oh, okay. Parcel? Remember. Parcel. Yeah. How is that? Is it cool? I haven't used it yet. You use it? No. So I have a question for you. What's your... I'm not really a front-end web dev anymore. <laughs> I haven't done that in quite a while. I've been, I've been in marketing for the last year and docs before that. But uh, one thing that I've, uh, that I've seen a lot is uh, like Node SaaS. Do you have any uh-huh. recommendations on how to like make that workflow a little bit less painful for folks who are on Windows? Node SaaS, like the CSS SaaS? Or? Yes, yeah, like the CSS SaaS. Like if you're doing it on if you're doing it on Windows, there's a little bit of pain. You have to install like Python, mm-hmm. and then there's building the packages doesn't always work. And I figured that's such a ubiquitous package. I wanted actually wanted to ask you: Do you have yeah. like guidance for somebody like me who hasn't really used it that much? I haven't used that either. Honestly, my experience with SaaS is mostly out of Ruby. Okay, cool. And and that's where it originated. Nice. But yeah, it. That, that's generally where I've done it. Okay, okay, that's cool. I haven't learned Ruby. That's definitely a challenging one. I looked at it for a little while, and I haven't really dug into it. Is that more your, your speed on the server side? Uh, typically, yeah. Cool, that's cool. I've been getting into Elixir and Phoenix lately as well. What's Phoenix? I haven't heard of that. So Phoenix is a web framework that is written in Elixir. Oh, cool. And Elixir's mm-hmm. language that's written on the Erlang VM. Oh, yeah, 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 that's cool. And so it, it's got some, it's functional, it's really fast. Nice. I mean, it's got a lot of things going for it. If you're used to the object-oriented style of programming, which if you come from Ruby, you really are, yeah. then, yeah, it takes a bit of getting used to. It's like, oh, okay, how do I do this? Yeah. And then once you get used to the functional way of thinking of things, then you start looking at it and you go to make an assignment or two yeah. or three and you figure out that equals is pattern matching and not assignment or comparison. And so that'll throw you for another loop. Yeah. But once you figure out those features, yeah. they almost become power features for you. Huh, that's cool. And so, I mean, there are definite trade-offs. I think Ruby's still easier. Right. But, I mean, Elixir has a lot of things going for it. It's really interesting. Nice. It's a newer community, and it's interesting to see where it goes. But, I've heard of it yeah. recently, but I haven't looked into it too much. I have to start doing some yeah. uh, research on this. Of course, I'm not going to get back on Elixir Lang. That'll work. Yep. Okay. So, I'll do yeah. some research on that. The, the last language I tried to pick up a little bit was Go. That was, that was fun. I liked it. Don't get some of the gestalt of the language yet, but I did. I did like it. Um, this is cool, though. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting things going out there in the yeah. programming world, yeah, and there are. you know, if you open yourself up to them, you can learn some really cool stuff. You really, so. really can. I um, uh, have always been kind of. I've always had kind of a mental block around Java, just the, mm-hmm. the language itself, which is ironic, and it was very similar to other languages that I'm very familiar with. Um, but at one point, I was uh, PMing the Java SDK, mm-hmm. and I asked some of the guys. I said. Um, this stuff will work on any JVM language, right? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that night I took a sample that had taken me probably three weeks to write in Java. It was terrible in Java. Mm-hmm. And had to bug the devs. What about this? What about that? A couple hundred lines of code. It's like, let me try this in Kotlin. So I got oh, it working yeah. in Kotlin in like uh-huh. probably an hour. 
And then I tried it in Scala and got it working in like yep. 45 minutes and was like, I, I need to go out there more. I need to, yep. I need to explore this stuff more. And I did for a bit. Mm-hmm. I, I like Scala a lot. It's a, it's a great little language. I had fun with that. I'm not got too deep in it but i do like the language a lot uh ruby i want to, I want to learn some more of that so yep. that's a good language i have some good friends back east that do that um, big in the community yep so and these headphones are nice. so uh, anything else that we should dive into w- with respect to signal r what i can think of off the top of my head i've basically brain dumped everything that i know at this point there was a period of time where I was really dug in with SignalR. I was, I was giving a lot of shows on it and everything. Um, and I've been definitely more on the Azure side for mm-hmm. the past couple of years. And coming back to SignalR right. after the APIs have really evolved mm-hmm. and the performance has really evolved, it's kind of been like all over again. So that's, right. been, that's been a lot of fun. I would definitely just drive people to the docs pages because they really are about the best place. Uh, here's one that you'd be interested in. We have a... This is one that a lot of people are saying we should just call it signal. I don't know. But this is basically a guide for how to handle anything that can happen on the JavaScript client mm-hmm. side uh, and talks about the generated proxy. If, what, that was the old generated proxy. Shows you how to wire it all up and everything. Um, but all this stuff is actually all out there um, on the docs. Um, I'm probably going to work on updating a few of these as well in the future. But I would just stay tuned. We have mm-hmm. a lot of other ideas we want to uh, do. The guys on the, the signal our service side, um, they have a lot of exciting things. Right. Right. The throughput that they have is amazing. Um, if you have like a, a, a you know high traffic site and you want to like show people things in real time, I would definitely mm-hmm. take a peek at that. You know, if you're okay having that the one thing on the server that's the hub, and you would definitely be able to party on it from a JavaScript perspective. I mean, you just literally have an empty C sharp class, back it up with that signal service in Azure, and now you've literally got unlimited real time capabilities. Um, I think their benchmarking is something like a hundred thousand simultaneous connections. So that's I think a hundred thousand simultaneous connections. Mm-hmm. going at two and a half million messages, messages. a second. Mm-hmm. It's like yep. mind-boggling, dude. So, and at one point, we had that without any backlink. There was a point where we were talking in hundreds of thousands on this machine. Like, oh, wow. you know, it could handle that much. Mm-hmm. You know, load tests were like running like crazy, make sure we knew when, when things were going to fall down. And I remember early on uh, hearing that, you know, that Damien asked me, he goes, what do you think the first thing that falls down? CPU? Not CPU. CPU is flat. Mm-hmm. You know, like, what was it? It was a network. Like, the network couldn't keep up. Like, we were sending so much data. Oh, wow. Like, we basically had to upgrade the network card and machine just to make sure that we were sent- we had enough throughput to just send the stuff. Oh, nice. Like, memory was flat, CPU was flat, network was flooded. Yep. So, and then get into all of the kinds of implications there, mm-hmm. which is one of the reasons why they've implemented the new streaming stuff with right. the buffering on either end. So mm-hmm. you can really handle your buffer and really control things right. well. So, but I would definitely look at it from a JavaScript perspective because... You can really make dynamic applications with it. Yep. Uh, really do some nice stuff on the UI side. So, and then the Java is definitely coming too. So we've got an Android client, uh, Android sample out there that we could uh, show you how to use uh, Signal R to communicate with the back end mm-hmm. from an Android phone. That's pretty neat. Uh, mobility, I would say you want to be careful because you're always going to have those connections going up and down. Right. So if you're doing something <laughs> on Xamarin or you're doing something you know, uh, on, in Java, I would apply the Spider-Man rule for anything mobility with Signal R because... When those connections drop, you're going to have to relaunch. Right. So just think about that. But again, if you're doing rest out and signal R for push, mm-hmm. it's really like brain dead. You know, it's like super, super simple. So Awesome. Yep. All right. Well, one thing that we do on this show at mm-hmm. the end of the show is picks. Is your job search stuck? Maybe you're not getting any interviews with employers. Or maybe you are, but no job offers. Or you may be new and not even know where to start. This is Charles Maxwood, and I'm releasing a new course and ebook on how to find a job as a software developer. The course walks you through the process of finding the types of companies you want to work for, getting their attention, and putting your best foot forward as the candidate they want. I've coached dozens of developers in looking for jobs and have been able to help several people find jobs within two weeks to two months. So whether you're new to development, can't find a great job that fits what you want, or are looking for remote work from an area without a strong tech community, I can help. Go to getacoderjob.com and sign up today. Do you have a few things you want to shout out about? I can shout out about tons of stuff. First thing I would do a shout out is to my lovely team on the uh, general session. Uh-huh. Uh, Anthony, Cecil, Jessica, James, Hanselman, and Seth, and all my team mm-hmm. backstage. Like You guys busted your tail for the last couple of months, and I want to thank you so much for making that a great success. Uh, that was great. Uh, stuff. Um, let's talk about stuff. Um, things that I've been having a lot of fun with recently. I want to give a big shout out to uh, Korg. I love Korg gear. 
uh, all my synthesizers record. Um, oh, nice. uh, and if you are into, like if you've thought about wanting to make electronic music or mm -hmm. experiment with stuff, um, I would look at their vocal line. Uh, that's the little sampler you saw me using here. Right. Um, you can go out and you can buy like a $2,000 sampler and, and not know how to use it, or you can mm -hmm. like get started with something like that and work your way up. I've spent the last four years learning how to like use that equipment. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, other, other, other things I would, no, no, you didn't say shout out, but did you call it? A pick. A pick. Uh, I would definitely I've got to give some love to the Seahawks because they need all the love <laughs> they can get right now. Um, <laughs> you must be based in Washington. I'm based in Washington. Yeah. Yes. I'm based in Washington. Um, and obviously my, uh, my beautiful two kids, they're awesome. So awesome. Um, uh, that's about all I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I have too many hobbies. I could be here all day. giving. Oh, yeah. Me. What about yeah. you? What do you have? So uh, I'll do a couple of picks. One of the things that I use, use when I travel is ExpressVPN. Oh. You know, I just, especially on hotel Wi-Fi. Like here at Microsoft Ignite, I'm mostly okay just yeah. using the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a zillion people if they really want to, you know, yeah. <laughs> pick me out of the crowd yeah, exactly. for whatever reason, whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. I still tend to use it at the conference just because, mm -hmm. especially if I'm going to like check my bank account or something. Right. Yeah. But other than that, it, it, it works really well. And uh, it, it really doesn't slow down my connection at all. Nice. So cool. I've, I've been pretty happy with it. Nice. So one thing that I'll shout out about, it's something that I have here. And it's mostly just um, to connect other stuff to my laptop. Because I have one of the amazing uh, MacBooks. You have that thing. That, uh, what do you think of that? So, yeah. So I pulled it out. He sees it. You don't. So let me explain <laughs> what I'm holding in my hand. <laughs> Um, so I, I have a couple of these from a couple of different brands and, uh, yeah. So the, the latest MacBooks they have the USB-C Thunderpole, what, three, four, 10, I don't remember what number it is yep. on the side and nothing else, which makes me so happy. I love it. But yeah, you can't connect anything to it because nothing actually connects with USB-C anyway. So I keep this in my bag. This one is uh branded J five and it has, Two USB-C ports, two USB ports, an SD card reader, and a mini SD card reader in it. And, nice. a, and an HDMI port on it. it. And I uh, looked at those. That could have saved my bacon a few times. So they're, they're pretty nice to have, especially if you have one of these amazing MacBook Pros. They are um, wonderful. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> since the USB-Cs plug in either way, you can hook it up whichever way you want, which is also nice. But yeah, so I have to read the SD card after we record this and put it in my machine. Nice. And uh, so I can just slide it into this or I can use the SD card reader they have there via USB. Nice. It actually fits better in, the, in their reader instead of this reader, but because cool. this one's really shallow. Yeah, I like um, that a lot. But That might be the next thing. Anyway, so, so it's nice to have. I have had this on my laptop with something in it and had my laptop slide off the table it was on mm. and yeah it destroyed the sd card that was in it and, and you know but this seems to have stood up to it pretty well um so i'm pretty happy with it i have another one that's another brand it works just as well cool yeah anyway it's it's kind of nice to have if you have to connect your laptop to anything other than power that's cool I guess the other one that I would have, you give me an inspiration now, uh, the other pick that I would make, have you ever heard of the Logitech Spotlight? It's a mm. clicker. Uh -uh. Um, I, I, mine's not charged, so I can't really show you its functionality right now, but it is a, uh, it's, I think they're actually called Log Logie now. I think they mm -hmm. kind of changed their brand. But it is a clicker for people who do presentations frequently. Um, but it not only is uh, more functional in terms of the fact that um, if you wanted to, you know, if you want to click, you can click, you can make, you can also make it zoom, but the form factor is, um, it's about the same size as the device that he's holding. Um, and what's nice about it is that instead oh, wow. of just having a laser pointer, it's got a spotlight. So when you shine it at the screen, you can hit the spotlight button and it makes mm -hmm. a big white circle. Like you oh, can nice. move it all around. People go nuts for it. I gave a presentation in uh, Sweden. Mm -hmm. I sold two while I was on stage. People nice. were like, what is that? And I told them and they bought it. So Logitech, uh, I love your, I love your spotlight. And I think he likes it too. So if I could charge it, I'd show you how it works. Yeah. I, I mean, generally when you're presenting, you just need like a button to advance or not advance. Right. 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 I hate the laser pointers. I do. You know, but, it's, it's, but this wiggles all over the place exactly. while but, you're holding it up. But yeah. this doesn't do that. It's smooth. Like yeah. the circle just stays where you want it. And you can like yeah. highlight somebody's face or you can highlight it. Yeah. Super fantastic. I think you might have sold another one of those. They're great. They're fantastic. That's about all I have today. 
Awesome. I really, I really like my AirPods too. They have been pretty nice. Yeah, AirPods are really nice. AirPods I, are nice. I have a set of those, and I use them all the time. That's I think cool. I'm gonna. My my wife doesn't listen to any of the shows. I might get her a pair for Christmas. Nice. So. That'd, be good. <laughs> That'd be funny. Um, and this is one of the the Korg Volcas that I was talking about. This is actually the Korg Volca sample. Oh, nice. Um, and the sample basically you can just load in sounds. I could put some sounds mm-hmm. from our show in here and. You, know, you can hear right. it a little bit. It's kind of yeah. quiet, but um, just, how much are they? Uh, that's probably each one of these. Uh, so there's the sample, a uh-huh. bass, keys, right? Uh, a bass drum, uh, a regular drum, mm-hmm. and then one called a FM for frequency modulation. Right. Each one of them is about one sixty US. Oh, um, that's that's doable. Totally reasonable, and it depends on kind of what you what sound you want to make. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I've got five of the six that exist. Right. The sixth one I don't want. This is not my thing. Um, and I've also got a microcord keyboard, um, and I use a different company's products called Arturia for my MIDI controllers. And I have two controllers, and they control all the devices. So that's kind of a fun, fun time home setup. I'll uh, bet. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I haven't done it enough recently because I've been conferencing. So at some point, <laughs> I want to go have next week and do a little music. So it'll be yeah. kind of fun. And if you, uh, uh, you know, people come to the session tomorrow, they'll be able to see some of that too. I know this won't be out by then, but if people come to the session tomorrow, they'll actually be able to play uh, the instrument yeah. from the audience. So that'll be kind of fun. That was me getting excited early. So, yeah, yeah, uh, he was, was awesome. in here, puts his arms in the air, all happy. And- <laughs> Yeah. It <laughs> was awesome. I, I know how that goes. Because it's super exciting. When code works, it's just a great application. Yeah, totally. So fantastic. So, yeah. Um, yeah. The thing I've been playing with lately as far as coding goes is I've been working on a system to manage the podcast. So, um, in fact, right before I came in here, I was writing a, I was writing the part where I invite members of my team yeah. that work on the podcast to the app. So oh, that cool. they can do their job nice, as nice. part of my account. So yeah, but I listened last week. I think you had three or four people on the show. There were like, yeah. quite a few. Are, are, is that normal? Do you have like yes, three that's or normal. Four normal. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I I also built in earlier today the part where I can invite the hosts. Cool. Nice. Nice. But but the rest of it is the production team. So the producer, the editor, show notes. Got it. Yeah. Does that have to be like a? Uh, does that have to be a real time thing? See where I'm going with this? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> So, so that that would actually be kind of interesting. We should do an experiment where I'll put a hub out there and give you a URL, and we can mm-hmm. just see if you can like you know party on it with your JavaScript uh, client. See what you could do with it. Yeah, that'd be fun. It'd just be cool. do something on YouTube or something. Yeah, just give you a URL. And see what you yeah. can do with it. Yeah, because uh, effectively we're just sending messages through. Yeah. So you know, you can do whatever you want. Um, but I thank you for having me on. This has been yeah. Great. Thanks for coming. No problem. No problem. I'm sorry to have a. Uh, less JavaScript skillage than most of the people that probably listen to your show. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's, it's interesting because uh, sometimes we get people that are really deep into JavaScript right. and sometimes we get people who, you know, like you aren't as deep into JavaScript, but you have experience with something that may solve a problem that somebody has. Right. That's right. And so, um, you know, I, I don't mind having those conversations and just kind of, you know, getting where, where, wherever we wind up at, mm-hmm. And then letting people go and check out what's out there. So, it's cool. That's um, cool. you know, you you folks listening, you know, go check it out. We'll yeah. see if you can make it work. Please do. Please check out the Signal stuff. And if you're in the JavaScript uh, side, if you have any ideas or pull requests or issues. Oh, yeah. Uh, Signal is open source. So, feel free to look at the GitHub and, you know, send us something. We'd love to, love to get some feedback from you. Good deal. Cool. All, All right. right. Well, we'll uh, wrap this one up. And thank you for coming, Brady. Thanks a lot. It's been fun. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.